minutes. We got a speaker from New Zealand. Uh, I'll introduce him to you in a minute. We were lucky to pick up a grant from IAC, the apiary industry um, advisory committee. Thanks for that. Um, we, we got a grant out of them that paid for Jason's travel from New Zealand to stay in a motel and all that. So we just acknowledge that we're very grateful that we managed to get that grant. Without that, it would have been difficult to finance and actually achieve that. Also, when we decided as a committee to get someone from New Zealand, we had no contacts. And there was only one company or person we could go to, and that was Acrotech, They're based in New Zealand. And they came up with a number of names. We met with them. And as a result, we ended up with Jason. So we are very grateful, and I want to thank Agrotech for actually supporting that. They, they also support Jason here while he is here, his ex extended stay. They, they look after him, uh, a motel accommodation, etc. So again, thank you, Agrotech, for uh, helping out with that one. Jason is um, a guy, and I was amazed. He's been in beekeeping 17 years. And if you see what he has achieved in 17 years, he runs 4,000 production hives. Can you imagine getting 4,000 hives? For me, as a small beekeeper, with only 20, 30 or 40 hives, that is just mind-boggling to get to 4,000. But that's not the only thing he does. He also got 3,000 queen bee breeding units. And then on top of that, he sells a lot of honey, exports it all over the world, and also exports bees all over the place. So he has really achieved a lot in 17 years, and I'd just like you to put your hands together and welcome Jason. Would you like to come up, Jason? Thank you. You used that mic there? I think I've got this one. Uh, when most people think about beekeeping, um, they think about they think about smoke and 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 bees dancing from flower to flower on on a sunny day. Um, the reality is, beekeeping in New Zealand is uh, is very intensive, and the stakes are always high. Um, <clears throat> today, I want to talk about um, my experience with Farrell Mike what I've learned over my career, and um, by the end of this talk, hopefully you'll be able to use some of, some of my learnings um, to help you guys deal with Varroa if it, if it arrives in Australia, which hopefully it won't. Or hopefully it won't stay in Australia. Um, <clears throat> I f first started beekeeping around 35 years ago as a 10-year-old boy. <clears throat> this was a few hives in the backyard of my um, parents' property uh, in North Canterbury, down in um, the South Island. Uh, the bees at the time, I remember being a lot more aggressive than the calm yellow bees that we have today. Um, and I remember as a kid, you know, running, running through the paddocks, being chased with, by what seemed like thousands of bees. Uh, in reality, it was probably only one or two, but... Um, it's amazing how fast a kid can run when there's bees after him. Um, at, at that time, I didn't have any proper protective uh, equipment, um, so, so I made do with um, a large flathead screwdriver as a hive tool. <coughs> um, socks on my hands instead of gloves, and uh, a, a bee suit, which was much too big for me. Uh, that I pinched off my dad, who was an electrician. He used to wear those blue electrical bee suits. Um, I, I used to go out with a local beekeeper. Um, so I, I enjoyed beekeeping so much. Uh, that I used to go out with a local commercial beekeeper called Barry Young um, in the weekends and school holidays. <clears throat> so he would, he would pick me up in the morning in his, um, his old Bedford truck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and at the time that truck was probably 30 years old and this was 30 years ago um, so it was, it was old it was, it was noisy, no air conditioning 
and it was extremely slow, but it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, he also helped me out with equipment um, as I made splits and caught swarms from, from my hives as I went from two to four to eight. And I think I got up to 10 hives, which was big numbers for a 10-year-old kid back then. Um, Yeah, so bee beekeeping was easy back then. There was no varroa. There was very little competition. Um, and I knew, I knew that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, it, as it turned out, when I left school, I went in a different direction for about 15 years. And I spent, I went into the marine industry, um, which took me, took me to a lot of places around the world, including um, prawn fishing in northern Australia. Um, also oil field work in the Middle East and various jobs in the marine industry around New Zealand. Um, and being true to being a seafarer, it also got me into quite a lot of trouble. But I won't talk about that today. <laughs> Another day, yeah. Um, at, about, at about age 30, I had, had some time on my hands again. Um, just finished renovating a couple of houses and I had a really cushy number driving passenger boats in the Auckland Harbour. And I decided it was time to get some beehives uh, and try, try that out again. So I purchased two beehives from, from a lady up in the, in the far north of New Zealand and went up and got them and brought them back to our property in Glenfield, which was uh, quite central Auckland. Uh, from, that, from that day, I was fascinated again by the bees. Uh, the way the colony operated with the queen and the workers and the drones all with their different jobs depending on the age of their life, etc. The drones had a seemingly great life until they were no longer required. I'm hopeful that my wife isn't quite as ruthless when winter comes for me. <laughs> um, the, way that, the way the hive it really fascinated me, the way the hive expanded in the spring the way they organised their colonies with the brood in the centre and the pollen outside of that and then the honey outside of that. And when the, when the timing was right, how they could make such enormous amounts of honey and then they'd contract again um, for the winter. Also, the different personalities of the bees. Um, the yellow ones seemed calm and more productive, and the small dark ones seemed a lot angrier uh, and, and, and less productive. So from that time I started expanding my hives again. Went from two hives to 10 to 50 to 100 and so on. And one thing that really struck me was um, how difficult it was to buy commercial numbers of uh, bees. Or, or to buy any more than one or two hives at a time seemed really difficult back then. So that's how we started our business. Um, we filled that gap in the market of supplying commercial numbers of bees to commercial beekeepers in the industry. We had a strategy um, of making three splits from every hive each year. That would be two for sale and one for myself. Um, so effectively, we doubled our numbers every year and, and we funded it with, um, with hives that we sold. So this strategy turned out to be quite, quite sustainable and it, it took about five or six years to get, about, to, get to 4,000 hives. Um, the hive numbers grow exponentially, a, bit, a little bit like Varroa does. Um, so the demand for bees at that time was driven by the Manuka honey boom um, which at the time was running at fever pitch. We had around a two-year waiting list on hives and we could name our price. As, as the saying goes, when, when people are digging for gold, we sell shovels, but you know, we, were, we were selling bees to the people digging for Manuka honey. Uh, over the years, we've changed the direction of our business a number of times as the industry changed. As the huge demand for bees to increased hive numbers around the industry um, started to slow down. We, we moved into, well, we started supplying hives for pollination services. We also started producing bulk honey, manuka and bush. 
and we scaled up our queen raising operations so we could produce and supply uh, quality queen bees to the industry. We also started looking uh, outwards to the world to see uh, who, who around the world could use uh, the bees we were producing in New Zealand. And we entered the Canadian market supplying packages and queen bees to Canada, or Canadian beekeepers. So now we run around 4,500 production hives uh, and nukes. Um, we've got a fairly substantial queen raising unit, plus we produce uh, bulk, bulk honey. This year we'll do a, a, around about 5,000 pollination jobs. Um, and we produce and buy bees from beekeepers all over New Zealand, from the top of the uh, North Island to the bottom of the South Island. We package those bees up and export them to, to Canada. Uh, and we do all of this while, we do all of this while managing uh, varroa mites very successfully. Um, so so onto, onto varroa mites. Um, so Varroa arrived in New Zealand in about 2000, um, and, and just like you guys are seeing now, uh, it created huge chaos and uncertainty in the industry. Many, many, many beekeepers sold up or walked away from their hives. Their hives collapsed and dies, died. Movements were restricted, and there was enormous uh, anxiety amongst beekeepers. A large percentage of beekeepers just totally left the industry and never came back. Um, but as it turned out, having, having Varroa wasn't, wasn't the end of the world, and we have learned to live with it quite successfully, as has pretty much every other country in the world, except for Australia. I'll get my second set of cards. <laughs> um, so what, so what, is, what is this Varroa? Um, so the Varroa is a blood-sucking parasite that lives off the bees and the brood in the hive. Um, so eventually it kills, kills the hives. We don't see hives last more than probably a year without Varroa treatments. Um, to give you some context, imagine a, um, a flea the size of a dinner plate attached to your chest and, and sucking your blood. That's what it's like for a bee. Um, so it's very draining. How did it come to New Zealand? We don't really know how it arrived in New Zealand. Uh, some people believe it came in, and in on some queen bees, illegally imported. Um, obviously not from Australia. Um, now how serious is it? It's pretty serious when it's not taken seriously enough. I've, I've personally seen Varroa destroy entire commercial businesses. Um, one, one story that comes to mind I had a young guy that was doing some work with us for a, for a while, and he, um, he went off to, to run his, his dad's business, uh, which was down in North Taranaki, which is on the west coast of the North Island. He called me one day and he said, um, we, we had a bit of a conversation, we talked about the weather and the price of honey and staff and uh, various other issues that beekeepers talk about on the phone. And then he went on to, um, say that he discovered a new varroa treatment, oxalic acid, oxalic fogging, sorry. His words were, it's so much cheaper, it's, um, it's more sustainable, it's, uh, there's no chance of resistance developing, and it's organic. Um, so, and he asked me if I'd buy his synthetic strips because he was going to start using oxalic oxalic fogging right across his business. He wasn't doing any sort of um, monitoring along with it, um, just assuming that it was working. So I, I suggested that maybe he should do a smaller trial on just a small number of hives and see, um, make sure it worked the way he thought it was going to work. Uh, but no, he was all in. So um, he, he went around about three months later uh, with, his, with his father and they picked up about 970 of their 1,000 hives. Sorry, of their 1,000 hives, they picked up 970 empty ones that were dead. Um, and this, this is not an isolated incident. 
this has been repeated over and over in the country with people not taking Varroa serious, seriously enough. So how serious is Varroa? Um, well, if you don't manage it properly, it's pretty damn serious. Um, so the tactics and best practice in my experience, um, we use... We, use, uh, we only use synthetic strips. Um, the way the strips work, you put the strips in the brood, in, in the brood colony, um, and the bees, as they're walking around the hive, they, they rub on the strips, and the chemical, um, the chemical rubs on the bees, which then kills the, kills the varroa mite or interrupts its uh, reproductive system. Um, Unfortunately, there's, bee, there's mites hiding in the brood as well, um, so it takes, takes two or three cycles, or two or three brood cycles uh, to get 100% mite knockdown with strips. Um, so they've got to, the strips have got to stay in for a little while, up, up to about 12 weeks, depending on the type of strips. Um, so with the Varroa strips, we use Appy Stan in the spring and, and we use Appy Var in the autumn, so two different chemical ranges. Um, we start putting in our first treatment on the 1st of September, and that's Happy Stan. Um, and we combine putting those strips in with, um, with other jobs, so it doesn't, take, it doesn't really take any extra time. So from the 1st of September, we're usually doing a first spring check, um, so our spring cleaning, we're doing our brood checking for AFB, we're feeding, we're splitting, that sort of thing. So we're in the brood nest anyway, um, and we use that we use that round to put our strips in. It usually takes around six weeks. So by the middle of October, we've normally got all our strips in. Um, and then we'll start our second our second round of treatment, which is our summer or autumn treatment. We we'll start that about the middle of January when we're harvesting honey. And again, at that time, we're in the brood nest, um, checking for disease, requeening, etc. So, again, it doesn't take it doesn't really take any longer to put the strips in. Maybe maybe a couple of seconds. Um, one of the uh, one of the key things with um, mite control is, is is managing the resistance. Uh, of the mites to the strips, so really, really important to uh, alternate alternate your treatments. So we always alternate our treatments. In, in spring, we're using uh, Appy Stan or Bavarol is the other one um, in that chemical range, and that's Fluvalinate is the chemical range. And then in the in the summer or the autumn, we'll use Appy Traz or Appy Var, and that's got Amitraz in it. So two totally different chemical ranges. Um, so if we start getting mites developing resistance to the appy stand, for example, um, when we alternate the treatments um, to appy traz, the appy traz will knock out those mites, um, that resistant line of mites, and they'll disappear. Whereas if we continue to use the same treatments, the resistance will continue to develop. Um, so that's a really critical thing. Not everyone in New Zealand alternates treatments. Um, and you may find that that's what happens here as well, but you, you get used to one, people get used to one treatment and think, oh, that worked well, and they just keep using it. Um, but it, it's really, really critical to alternate your treatments. Um, um, the strip placement is also, is also really critical. Um, so we like to place the strips uh, evenly in the brood, and we, we have to take into account whether it's spring and the brood nest is expanding or if it's autumn and it's contracting. So, um, so we'll place the strips so that as the, as the colony size changes or moves, we're hoping that it won't move away from the strips. What we don't like to see is like a brood nest like this and then the strips outside of it because it's totally ineffective. Um, and sometimes that can happen without, in the autumn place the strips where you think it's right and then the brood nest shrinks down and they end up outside of the strips, uh, sorry, the strips end up outside the brood nest and, and not working. So that's, 
uh, that's something to think about. Um, also, we, we, we only run single brood box hives now. Um, uh, so, with most of the strips, it's, well, with all of the strips that I know of, it's, it's two strips per brood nest. So, if you're running a double brood hive, then instead of using two strips, you need to use four. Um, and you, you also, in a double brood hive, you can find that brood nest moves around a lot more than a single brood hive. So, um, and the, the cost of the strips, you know, around about eight to ten dollars per treatment. Uh, that's using two strips. So if we're using, if we're having to use four, then we're looking at twenty dollars per treatment. And if you're running, let's say, five thousand hives, that's um, what is that? That's a hundred thousand dollars instead of fifty thousand dollars for treatments, and that, that adds up. Um, <clears throat> another thing that is really important for or really helpful for the mite management is, is regular requeening. We, we do find that um, varroa mites and treatments are very hard on queens. So I don't know what the useful life of a queen is for you guys. Maybe it's two or three years. But with, with varroa, we find the useful life of a queen is six months to a year and a half, maybe two years at the max. Um, so we. We're always, you know, we're always looking at requeening, and if, if we find a hive that's had a heavy mite load, um, we'll give it, and, and the queen looks to be fine, we'll give it frames of brood if we've got them, and we'll requeen it straight away because that that queen won't recover from a heavy mite loading. Um, the other thing we the other thing we like to do is uh, blanket requeening in the autumn. If we can't requeen everything in the autumn, we'll pick. Um, segments of our business and requeen those segments. Um, and we do that with protected queen cells. Do you guys use protected queen cells here? Have you? Nope. So queen cells, we, we protect them by wrapping a piece of tape around them. Uh, the, the queens will only take a queen, will only tear down a queen cell from the side. So if we, if we put them in a hose or, or wrap a piece of tape around them, that queen cell becomes protected. So we'll go around, we'll put a protected queen cell in all of, all of our hives. Um, and around the same time, we'll put the varroa treatments in. So that, that queen cell will hatch, a virgin queen will hatch out. She'll go and kill the, um, kill the current laying queen that's in the hive. Um, and then... Um, yeah, and then you'll end up with a brood break. So you'll end up with three weeks, around about three weeks, where there's no queen laying eggs in that hive. Um, and, and during that time of the brood break, you've got your mite treatments are working at their peak. So you end up with a hundred percent knockdown really quick. Um, so I know a lot of people here have talked about that I've spoken to have talked about. Well, what do we do? There's no brood break in Australia, but you can create your own brood breaks with requeening. Re um. <clears throat> so there, I think they're the main things with um, varroa, the varroa management. Um, however, um, probably the, the, the biggest cause of varroa my issues that I've seen in my business and in other businesses in the industry um, is something that I call uh, VBB. Um, and that, that stands for very bad beekeeping. <laughs> We've all seen it. Um, so VBB, you know, some people call it PPB, piss poor beekeeping. Um, but this can be caused by many things like um, inexperience, time pressure, complacency, neglect, etc. We've all seen VBB before. Um, so to, to manage VBB is probably more difficult than managing mites. Um, um, so we, we focus on three things to eradicate VBB. Um, education, accountability, and, and checking. Uh, and these three things give us probably the best return on investment with our mite control. Um, so number one, we, we educate our beekeepers 
we have around 10 beekeepers working out on the field, and for the most part, I'm not, I'm not working with them, so they're out on their own. Um, so every time we have a new round of treatments to do, we sit down, we have a whiteboard, um, and, and even the guys that know what they're doing, we, we, have, a, we have a refresher. Um, it's not just telling them what to do, it's but why, why are we doing it, how are we doing it, what are the, what are the issues if we don't do it properly. Um, that's the education piece. So we do that before each, before each Varroa mite round. Uh, the, the next thing is accountability. Um, the accountability is actually quite easy and it, and it works for a lot more than just um, Varroa management. Um, so we, we're big on accountability in our business. Um, and the, way we, the way we do this is every beekeeper uh, initials and dates the lid on the hive every time it's worked. Um, and this very simple, simple act of uh, initialing and dating the hive means that that beekeeper's taken ownership of that hive and the work that's been done on it. And um, it, it reduces or eliminates almost all incidences of um, VBB. The standard of beekeeping took a, um, a big jump in the right direction when we started um, doing this. Uh, so, so I've found it very, very important, especially when we have lots of beekeepers working lots of hives. Uh, so to support the um, accountability, we also have a checking process. Um, so we, our team leaders uh, will spend half a day a week going out and checking hives that have been worked uh, for developing issues, and uh, for developing issues or training opportunities. So if there's a developing mite issue or, or, or something else coming up, and then we're aware of it early. And not, not, all's not lost. We can, we can change what we're doing, we can plan, we can do some training um, in, um, and you know, it's, it solves a lot of problems, which I think we get back to our hives about every six weeks and sometimes that's a, that's a long time between checks. Um, so it's good to know if there's an issue developing. Um, the, yeah, the, the, checking, the checking and the initialing, it was at first very difficult to get that across the line, like the beekeepers uh, were not keen on it, neither were the team leaders. But once they started doing it and started seeing the benefits, um, you know, they all got on board with it. Um, so you just think about this, like, think about the checking, like, like getting your prostrate checked. No one wants to do it and no one wants to get it done. But once it is done, you're glad because either there's nothing to worry about or it could have just saved your life. Um, so, um, one of the other things that we're, uh, one of the other big challenges is, is, is you know, putting our bees in stressful situations. Um, So um, in New Zealand, it's, it's very difficult to be economically viable and not put bees into stressful situations. So um, the best way we've found to combat that is we, we, send the bees, we send the bees in fat and they come out okay. If we send the bees in skinny, they come out even skinnier or sometimes dead. Uh, and what we do know is uh, Varroa might take advantage of... Um, bees that are under stress. Um, so we, we saw this quite clearly in New Zealand this year because um, it was quite a wet, um, quite a wet spring, summer and autumn and there was very low honey production. So the bees that we um, bought out of the, our winter sites and, and, and sent into pollination um, to do this, they go into large dump sites with 500 or up, up to 1,000 hives, and then they go into kiwi fruit or um, avocado orchards, where they're competing with lots of other hives in the area. Uh, and they're also on a single uh, low-quality pollen source while they're in those orchards. Um, so they're under, a lot of, they're under a lot of stress. Then they come out, they go back into dump sites, then they go back into their, um, into their honey sites. Um, 
And what we, what we saw this year was that the bees that went into pollination, when they went back to their honey sites, they had much higher mite loading than the bees that hadn't, hadn't gone into pollination. Um, the ones that came out and then also went on to sites that didn't make honey had even higher mite loadings again. So, um, yeah, we do find the key with that is to send them in fat. If we don't send them in fat, uh, if we send them in skinny, they come out even worse. Um, um, so, in conclusion, um, we're, not, we're not sure if uh, Varroa is here to stay in Australia. Um, you guys are or the, we're, you're doing a pretty good job of eradicating it by the looks of it. And if you can eradicate it, that is by far the best thing to do. Um, but if not, um, while that'll be disappointing, it's not the end of the world and it's not the end of the industry. Um, so if, if you're vigilant and you avoid VBB, it can be managed very successfully. You get the small stuff right, don't underestimate the damage the mites can, can, can cause. Create accountability and hive ownership amongst your teams and, and put in place a regular checking process. And then in stressful situations, if the bees go in fat, they come out okay. Um, so even with uh, Varroa mites, um, you know, there, there, is a, there is a future for that 10-year-old kid that has a handful of hives in his parents' backyard. That's it. Thank you. So I think, I think we've got about 15 minutes for any questions. Is that right? We take questions, time is on there. We've got about 40 minutes, so there's plenty of time for questions. We've got two mics going around, and it's not... Oh, we're back on the air. Thanks. <laughs> um, there's plenty more time. Uh, Jason's going to be back with us tonight, and I think tomorrow morning by 10.30. Uh, so this is not the end of Jason. You'll see him again, and he will continue on his talk and um, give us more information on Varroa. So we've got Andrew with a mic, and I think... Uh, Ken is at the back there. Any questions? Thank you for that interesting talk. Um, okay. My question is about the uh, varroa, the oxalic acid fogging, because yep. my understanding was that it's actually a successful mite treatment. So was it in fact being implied wrongly? Uh, yeah, I think it is successful, um, but it's got to be applied right, and you, you need to combine that with, um, with monitoring. So if it's not working, um, that you know about it because the, the fogging doesn't get into the brood it only gets the mites that are on the bees and it also doesn't stick around the hive so once you fog it it, um, it kills the mites on the bees and then it disappears and then you've got mites uh, inside the brood that come out afterwards yeah Thanks, uh, Daniel Lefer from Arbic. Um, great messaging, great presentation, thank you. Um, I was lucky enough last week to be at the APNZ conference in New Zealand and they talked about a, a reduction in commercial beekeeper numbers now. So I think we've seen 28% reduction in commercial beekeepers across New Zealand, um, mainly because of the honey pricing and, and the tough time you guys are going through. A lot of the beekeepers I talked to were saying that reinfestation is becoming a real big issue now where bees are being abandoned because they can't, they've either gone broke or can't afford to run the bees and they're becoming a, a cesspool for varroa breeding. Um, and then in between the treatments, they're seeing much higher reinfestation coming in. Is, is that what you're seeing over there? And, and if so, how are you combating it? Um, so we're definitely hearing a lot of that. Um, we're, not, we're not seeing it ourselves, although we are hearing people around us saying that um, 
they're having reef reinfestation. Um, yeah, so we're also hearing people talk about resistance. However, this hot sign, they've, they've tested the mites for resistance. They're not finding any resistance. Um, so we're, we're definitely seeing, like, if we go through a site, um, but you guys call it a load, but and your loads are a lot bigger than ours. Like, our, our sites are 16 to 32 hives. Um, but if we, if we go through, through a site that size in April, we might see one or two hives in that site that um, have a high mite loading. Um, but we're not seeing it across the board. We're not seeing, um, we're not seeing entire sites collapse from Varroa. Uh, unless we're doing something wrong, like we're not treating it, um, not treating it properly, or we're getting to it too late. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of hyper focus on mites at the moment in New Zealand as well. I mean, there's definitely reinfestation from um, hives being left to die um, from neighbouring beekeepers in certain areas. But um, I also think, you know, when you, you know when you buy a new car and all of a sudden you're seeing them everywhere. Um, I think it's a little bit like that with the mites. <coughs> Everybody's talking about mites, so people are starting to focus on them and they're seeing mites everywhere, but in actual fact, if you look hard enough, you're always seeing mites everywhere in, in the autumn in New Zealand. It just seems to be there's a lot more focus on it at the moment. I'm not sure, does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, Jason, my name is Lindsay, and I come from a very cold place, like New Zealand, colder than Victoria even. <laughs> and we rely on our income that we get from manuka honey. Uh, and we know that in New Zealand, the large countries, the UMF, uh, have a lot of people suppliers for that, and, but the only true labelling that should be on manuka is MGO, methoglyoxal, which is the actual ingredient in the honey. We have been trying for years to work with New Zealand, uh, but to no avail. Um, I believe you're a, quite an innovator, so what is your uh, perspective, what's your view on working together with Australia? <laughs> How many other Kiwis are there in the room? <laughs> um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm all for working with Australia on Manuka honey. Um, we've had some pretty good years on Manuka honey, and we've had some pretty bad ones. Um, but um, yeah, I'm not. To be honest, it's not our focus, and I don't. I don't get involved um, in the in the naming rights and all that sort of thing. But I'm I'm happy for you guys to have the name Manuka honey, and uh, I'm happy to work. You know, I'm happy for New Zealand to work with Australia. I think. You know, in fact, I don't think there's any other choice now. We need to work together on it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name's Liz Baker. I just had a question about the, um, where the, what your view is of the impact on the hobby beekeeping side of things. Obviously, you're commercial, but what, what happened with the hobby beekeepers when, um, when all the varroa sort of came about and took off and... Yeah, I mean, we used to sell uh, we used to sell a lot of bees to hobby beekeepers, and um, the thing we quite liked about selling bees to hobbyists it's like reoccurring revenue because every year the bees die. <laughs> um, <laughs> North America, yes, yep. Canada, yeah. Yep. Naval says 48% of their bees this year. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, there's some very good hobbyists out there that take it seriously, and the hobbyists love, love trialling different sorts of treatments, you know, um, and, and different ways of doing things, which is great. Um, yeah, I... I um, I suppose the impact on hobbyists is you can't anymore, you can't, you can no longer just have a hive and leave it in the backyard. It needs to be 
treated and if you're going to try different treatments, it needs to be monitored and treated. Um, and some hobbyists, you know, are good at it and others, others get their hives and, um, you know, forget about them and then replace them in the spring. Um, does that... Do they? Yeah. 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 Question over here. Yeah. G'day, Jason. Lindsay Calloway from Malden. Um, with your forced uh, supersedure in autumn, do you have a percentage success rate for that? It, it really depends on the weather. Um, but if we can do it in um, February, we get, you know, as long as the weather's reasonable, normally we get 90, 95%. Um, Probably something that's quite common with that forced supersedure is we end up with two queens in the hive, um, and we see that quite a bit. Where the, I don't know, the, maybe the bees don't feel like killing the mated queen at that time of year, so you end up with a mated queen and a virgin, then two mated queens. Um, so we see a bit of that, but the success rate's really high, like most times, well over ninety percent. Yeah. The later we leave it, so if we leave it into March, percentage will go down, maybe it'll go to 90%. If we do it in April, we might go down to 70% and the matings will be bad. You know, they'll look good, but they won't be good. Yeah. Hi, Sue's bring um, hobbyist with, oh sorry, Sue Ring hobbyist without a hive yet. <laughs> Um, AFB's the big thing that we're talking about in Victoria at the moment. I'm wondering um, if you've got any insights on the impact of that and Varroa or instead of Varroa. Um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know that Varroa's had a big impact on AFB. I don't think our incidence of AFB has really um, has really gone up or down because of Varroa. Um, but I guess one thing that it, it would mean is there's no, there's no wild hives left. Um, so we can't have, well, potentially we don't have, we don't have it, have it spreading as much in the wild hive um, kind of population. Um, but yeah, we have we haven't we haven't seen a big impact on AFB. No. Yeah. Orkan Barnefors, uh, I used to have hives in Sweden with Varroa, and uh, I look at Apistan and all of that back then, and I found it to be quite expensive. In New Zealand, are lactic acid, oxalic acid, formic acid, etc., available? Because I managed quite successfully to manage hives that way. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's all available in New Zealand. Yeah. As a treatment. As a, mm. Here's nothing approved yet, and it's only seemed to be the Apistan, etc., that's on the short list to be approved if we would need it. Yeah. So, so the answer to the question is yes, that's all available in New Zealand, yeah. G'day, Peter DeBicke. Um Just a quick question in relation to how the actual varroa mites affect the strength of the hive in spring and the way that does it have any actual impact on the swarming drive and surge at that time? And yeah, what has been your experience, um, you know, prior to varroa and after varroa? Um, so we don't... We I, I don't think it has any uh, major effect in the spring. So usually when the bees are coming out of winter, um, the varroa mite levels are very low anyway. Um, and so we, we put our strips in at the start of September. And um, I suppose when we're getting, when we're getting to October, um, we start, we're starting, if the, the hives that we haven't got strips in, we're starting to see mites on the drones, on the drone um, burr comb as we're cracking, you know, as we're, as we're separating the boxes. You know how there's drone burr, burr comb on top of the frames? We would see mites on those. Um, but we know drone, drone comb is like the mite, is a mite magnet. Um, but 
as long as we're getting our treatments in on time, we're not seeing any impact in the spring, um, with the spring build up at all. If we don't get our treatments in on time, absolutely, um, uh, that the hive gets pretty unhealthy and um, it goes backwards and will collapse. Yeah, yeah Jason, um, what about the uh, strips when you're trying to produce honey? How does, how does that go? Um, well, you should take your strips out while you're producing honey, although if you're using oxalic strips, they can stay in um, as they're organic. Also, the, um, the apitraz or apivar um, that has amitraz in it, so that chemical will collect in the honey. Uh, that's why we use it in the autumn, those treatments. Uh, the apistan or the, or the bavarol, um, the chemical in those treatments doesn't show residues in the honey, however it does show residues in the wax. Um, that's why we, we'll use those treatments uh, in the spring, so if they are on when the bees are making honey, it's not, it's not going to show up with residues. I'll have a question, thanks. Um, what, what, what do you think has been happening to the beekeepers over the last sort of, you know, pre-varroa and post-varroa? Are they a different type of person or is it the, the same beekeepers? They've just learned to do things differently and particularly in terms of that discipline that you've talked about, like the accountability and the checking. Um. So, for example, did that young fella, did he not have certain attributes of the way he had to think and operate? Or yeah. was it just like a bad decision that was unlucky? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you do have to be disciplined now. Like, you can't, you can't just leave hives to fend for themselves. Um, so if you're not getting your treatments in on time, um, if you're not checking for issues that are developing, um, then, then absolutely your, your hives will die. You know, um, so yeah, you definitely can't. You definitely can't be relaxed about varroa. If that's if that answers. Yeah. That's true, but I guess I'm also thinking that you spent sort of 15 years doing quite different things in different sorts of learning environments. Um, so many of which would have been like the uh, the navy would be quite disciplined, I expect. So you need, like you really knew that you had to do something and knew you could do it. You would have to do it, and there were real consequences. Um, I don't really know, I haven't been beekeeping that long, but if, if it's been easy, like it possibly is easier in Australia than it was in New Zealand anyway, then you know, are we sort of like, do we risk losing some beekeepers or how do we encourage beekeepers who maybe are not naturally disciplined, and I probably include myself in that, um, to sort of develop that? Is it, is it just something that we do ourselves or do we have to like do it together somehow? Yeah. Tough question. Okay. It's a <laughs> tricky question. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's it's almost self um, policing. I mean, if you're not if you're not disciplined, mm. and, you, and you don't um, get your treatments in and uh, do that sort of thing, then you'll simply go out of business. You know. So those those beekeepers that can't be disciplined, they w won't last in the industry um, because their hives will all die. Uh, and if they don't die all at once, then they'll reduce significantly over, you know, each year. Um, yeah. Again, I think vero managing varroa is relatively easy. It's, it's kind of managing, um, managing the business and the, and the people is probably more difficult. <laughs> yeah, um, Kieran Murphy from uh, AgVic. We've done a bit of research in uh, hive health. Is there, um, all your monitoring's all physical monitoring after you've done your treatment. Is there any other technologies coming in or, you know, remote monitoring or sensor monitoring going on? Oh, I, th I think there's all sorts of re remote monitoring stuff available. Um, I, I, I don't know how well it will monitor the, the mite levels in a hive. I don't, I've not heard of anything that monitors that. Um, yeah. 
if there are no more questions, uh, we'll go to more and tea. I'd just like you to put your hands together. Oh, sorry, one hey, John, more. John, there is one. Go. I'll help you out, John. Another question. Um, monitoring. So you guys, I assume, would be doing alcohol washes for the... Or could you just talk about um, how you do your monitoring um, and, and whether you do it pre and post application? And also, you know, thresholds. So what do you use um, as a guide to understand mite loadings and if those mite levels are taking off? Yeah, so, so for the most part, that's visual. Um, so we don't, um, for the most part, we don't go down and we don't go around and routinely monitor for mites uh, unless we're seeing an issue or a reason to monitor them. Um, it needs to be a quick one. So, um, I don't, I don't know that many beekeepers in New Zealand do that. Like you, you maybe have this idea that you've got to be going around every, every three days and monitoring for mites. Um, but I think the reality is it's not like that. Um, so generally we can see if there's mite issues developing because you start to see the mites. Um, we, we do monitor the mites um, in January and February with alcohol washes. Um, but we do that. We do that for a different reason. We do that because we have a requirement um, for our, to export bees into Canada. Um, we have a requirement to have a mite level at a, at a certain um, at a certain level to have a mite numbers at a certain level. So, um, but aside from that, unless we're seeing unless we're seeing issues or unless we have a reason to go around and start monitoring. Generally it's, generally, it's visual. You know, you can see visually that you've got, oh, there seems to be a lot of mites, uh, and we might, we might start looking into it deeper, you know? Yeah. Jonathan uh, Chevra Honey. Um, I just want to um, reiterate about the honey production. I'm a little bit worried about the inclusion of chemicals and the effect on marketing raw honey, especially the premium honeys. Yeah. And what are our obligations to declare chemicals on the ingredients or part of the process of keeping or processing honey? And um, pollination, I understand, probably all get away with having chemicals in the hive, but actually selling a natural product to people after chemical impact? Please. Um, so like I say, the appy stan or the Baverol, um, those residues don't collect. So if you tested them, they don't show in the honey at all. Uh, the the, the Traz or um, Apivar, you do end up with Amitraz residues in the honey. But are you talking about being organic or? Yeah. Um, so, so our honey, I mean, our honey gets tested for all those things, and we're not seeing residues in the honey. Um, however, um, I, I, I don't see statements anywhere saying, you know, mite treatments have been used in the honey. Um, but it's, it hasn't it hasn't caused an issue for us, no. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, as I said earlier, Jason is only just warming up. Um, he will be back tonight. The whole evening is all about Baroa, and he'll be back on at 1.30 tomorrow afternoon. So there's plenty more opportunity to ask questions. Uh, Jason, this is just a small talk of our appreciation for you coming out. Oh, thank you. Enjoy it. Thank you. Before we go to morning tea, just a couple of announcements. And just the one question. When the questions are asked, what happens to the obvious beekeepers when Varroa comes and all that? When Varroa arrived in the part of the world where I was born, uh, there were lots of small local beekeeping associations and the numbers just dropped down. A lot of people just gave it away. Associations that were way older than what we are, and we've been around longer than 20 something years, they just collapsed. Some of them joined up to try to survive and then they fell over. And it's only just in the recent years, maybe five, ten years, that some of that is coming back. There are clubhouses, beautiful clubhouses. We would be jealous. We would love to have them. And they're just sitting there. 
no members and just all this collapsed because of Faroa. It was, that was the end of the associations and beekeeping and everything.